We're very excited to be able to share um, some new findings from the SCAD research programme. Uh, so what we've done in this particular research is that we have very carefully studied uh, images from the inside of the coronary arteries of patients who've had SCAD. These are patients from the UK, from our Beat SCAD, SCAD survivor community, and also patients from uh, around the world. So actually uh, large groups of patients from Spain, from the Czech Republic, from everywhere. Again, as with a lot of SCAD, SCAD research, we're very grateful to our collaborators for enabling us to move forward quickly and get the answers that patients want. So what these laser light images of the inside of the coronary arteries, they're called OCT, what these OCT images have shown us uh, is through careful measurement, they've given us a clearer understanding of what the problem is that triggers a SCAD event. So we already know that what happens in SCAD is that you e essentially develop a bleed or a bruise in the wall of a coronary artery. And as the blood accumulates in the vessel wall, it essentially squashes or compresses the artery from the outside, and that stops the blood that should be flowing down the coronary artery to the heart muscle, and that's what causes the heart muscle to die and causes a, a heart attack to occur. What we haven't understood before is how or why that bruise or bleed in the vessel wall develops. And what this study has, uh, has done is it has uh, made some progress in, in terms of answering that question. And specifically, there have been two possibilities. The first is that a tear develops in the wall of the artery. And you'll often hear people talking about a tear in a coronary artery, and that's essentially that uh, there's a, a route into the vessel wall that develops and allows blood to seep in and then the bruise to form and a dissection to occur. The second idea is, the, if you like, the so-called outside-in uh, hypothesis or idea, and that is that the, br the bruise arises um, from the beginning in the wall itself. So there's actually a bleed in the wall that then spreads and develops. And using the OCT images and carefully measuring the bruise, the lumen itself, and also the little bit of elastic tissue that holds the whole of the outside artery together, what we've demonstrated is that we find uh, a proportion of, in a proportion of patients there is no tear. So they, there is, you can see that there's a bruise and there's no connection. So that's telling us something, first of all, that at least a proportion of these patients don't have a tear at all. The second thing is that those people that don't have a tear, when they're compared to those that do have a tear, it appears that the SCAD, the area of dissection, is under pressure. It's squashing the lumen. It's expanding that elastic tissue outwards. So you end up with a, a sort of a larger bruise, a smaller lumen, and an expanded artery. And the fact that the artery seems to be under pressure is very suggestive that the problem arises in the vessel wall, and that potentially any tears that do develop may actually be from the outside, from the bruise, in towards the uh, lumen, as we call it, the place where the blood should be flowing, rather than from the inside, where the blood is flowing out into the vessel wall. So why is that piece of information useful? <laughs> so the, the reason that that is useful is because it helps us to focus the research. It means that we should be thinking about the vessel wall and how and why a bleed might occur. We know, for example, that the wall of an artery actually, believe it or not, has its own blood supply. It has its own little tiny blood vessels that supply the wall. There are also little tiny blood vessels that cross through the artery on their way to supplying bits of fat and tissue that are around the heart. And what this research suggests, at least, is that we should be thinking a bit more about these microvessels and whether it's either a fragility or a strain or a stress or some, something that disrupts those vessels, which, if you like, is the primary event which causes a SCAD. So that's a hypothesis. It's an idea. But the research, the OCT research that we've done, if you like, provides some support for that idea. Okay? It's not impossible that there may be some patients for whom the inside out root is still relevant, but it is giving us, if you like, 
a steer in the direction in which we should be thinking about, if you like, what happens at the level of the blood vessel to cause a SCAD. So we're excited about that because it gives us, uh, if you like, motivation as to the right direction to go next to try to look for more answers for our patients. So mo all of these uh, OCT scans were done uh, at the time of the patient's SCAD event to help the interventional cardiologists to make decisions about what to do. So if you like, we're exploiting the information that was gathered at the time to try and understand the disease a bit more. And again, we're very grateful to our colleagues around the UK in particular for helping us by sending us these images to analyse. So that's why it's taken quite a long time. I mean, these were 65 OCT images, which for SCAD is enormous. So, you know, the last, uh, I think the next biggest series that's published is, is nine cases. So this is a really big additional series. Um, uh, but the advantage of OCT is that because it uses laser light, it has a very high spatial resolution. So you can see things in much more detail, and that's what's enabled us to do these uh, very fine measurements. And excitingly, I started this a moment ago, um, there are some cases, very few, but a small number of cases, where they've also got OCT imaging at follow-up. And it's very interesting to see how the bruise um, reabsorbs, because as you know, SCAD, if it's not managed with stents, uh, will uh, the bruise will absorb back into the body and how the artery re-expands back up again uh, and interestingly the signs of pressurization ease in recovery so the elastic tissue I mentioned as being expanded outwards eases back in the the false lumen as we call it the bit where the bruise is starts to absorb away you can see little micro channels to help with that healing process and then the lumen where the blood flow eases back out to where we would expect it to be. So again, there are some insights that we have from this study about the healing process in what we call conservatively managed SCAD patients. So SCAD patients who've not uh, had to have stents or bypasses at the time of their events. So it is helpful. Um, so one of the questions in the uh, interventional cardiology community has been about the use of OCT. Is it helpful and is it safe? Uh, the question about safety in particular is that you have to inject a dye into the artery, the same dye that you do when you take the pictures of the arteries, but you have to inject that dye in order to be able to visualise the artery because you have to get rid of the blood for the light to be able to see the vessel wall. And essentially what we've found with this study is that OCT in and of itself probably does not confer much additional risk, maybe a tiny bit but only a tiny bit. Um, what does uh, uh, sometimes make things worse is the actual process of instrumenting a coronary artery. So putting the wire down and, and then potentially going on with balloons and so on to, to treat arteries. And I think what the conclusions of the, uh, uh, of the study um, uh, find is, and this is a sort of a growing consensus amongst people who look after scan patients, is that where it comes to intervening and looking after the dissected arteries of SCAD patients, we should be as gentle as we can. So if we have a patient where we know what the diagnosis is and uh, we think we can manage this without stents and bypass grafts, then actually probably in that context maybe we shouldn't be doing OCT imaging. We know what the answer is, we don't need the OCT to help us, if we're going to leave it alone, maybe we shouldn't even put a wire down. If, however, we don't know what the answer is, we now know that because SCAD is an important diagnosis to make, it's managed differently, then using the OCT catheter to make a diagnosis where you're not certain is probably a useful thing to do. And if you have to stent, and let's remember that there are uh, quite a few cases of SCAD where you know, it is not possible to manage the situation without stents. There's no, not enough blood flowing down the artery and the cardiologist looking after the patient has to do something to restore the blood supply to help the heart. In those patients, the OCT catheter can be very useful to help the cardiologist to guide what to do, where to stent, how big a stent, how long a stent, you know, what does the artery look like after the stenting and so on. 
So I think what it does is it helps interventional cardiologists like me, people who put stents into patients, it gives us a bit more guidance about when we should use OCT and when we shouldn't. I think there are a number of follow-ons that we, uh, we're uh, interested in doing, um, both looking at OCT, other imaging, so there's uh, ultrasound imaging of, ultra, of, of coronary arteries, that's something that we're interested in looking at very soon, uh, and trying to put all of this together, uh, again, to build a clearer picture of exactly what happens at the time of the SCAD and where possible in the recovery phase, because I think all of that helps to inform us of both what the cause of the problem is, but also how as uh, doctors we should be approaching patients who are presenting in that situation to make sure we do the best for every patient.